It's good to be with you again this morning as we continue our teaching and understanding of the spiritual heart of man. We're going deeper today, right into the very crevices of your heart, and God's going to show you what's there and what we need to do. But I'm going to start again with Luke chapter 6, verse 43, and I'm going to read that just as a reminder. The good tree bears, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things stored up in his, from the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow or the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. So what Jesus is basically saying here, a good heart is not going to produce bad character, and an evil heart is not going to produce good character. Again, it comes back to the heart that the heart has to be changed. Your whole Christian life, your victories, your eternal rewards, what you're going to accomplish for Jesus, it all comes down to your heart condition. All right, so we're going to get into the heart now. And to understand this, Jesus called the heart here a spiritual storehouse. We're talking about our spiritual heart. It's right in this area where our physical heart is. We have a physical heart that pumps blood to every part of our body, brings life to every part of our body, but we also have a spiritual heart because this is where our emotions is. This is where our grief is. This is where our sorrow is. This is where our fear is. All these things are down here. They're connected to the brain, to the neurological system and all of that, but we're not going to get into that part. <laughs> we're just going to talk about your heart for now. My heart, everybody's heart. So this is for everybody, saved, unsaved alike. It's all the same principles. So uh, the heart is a spiritual storehouse. So everything that has ever happened to you in your life, everything that you have ever saw, everything that you have ever, ever heard, every negative thing that has ever happened to you, your negative reactions to that negative thing, it's all stored up in your heart, and that's what you're living out of. All right, and so the heart is a spiritual storehouse of all that has influenced us in our life. Every child born into this world has a spiritual heart. This is why God has instituted the marriage covenant so that he could have godly children, it says in the book of Malachi. Every child born into this world needs the proper love and discipline from both a father and a mother to be emotionally balanced properly. All right, all the mother's attributes are in God. All the father's attributes come from God. God made Adam and Eve. So we don't have women and men are different. And so the child needs input from both and discipline from both so that he can have a balanced life. I want you to understand God created Adam and Eve. There was nothing evil in their hearts. Our hearts have been created in such a way to store and to have the fullness of God's life in them. And now, that's pretty amazing. The problem is we've messed them up, or they were messed up when we were born. We're going to talk about this. What is in our heart and how did it get there? So we're going to talk uh, about three basic causes of why we are the way we are. First of all, some of it is hereditary. It's the law of Genesis that we beget after our own kind. So every seed does, every person does. And so I come from a large family of nine children. Eight of us are still alive. But we all have characteristics of our parents. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, my mom used to say. But I have a brother who's a year and a half older than I am, but he's more like my dad. I was more like my mother. In, in my heart <clears throat> to speak. And so it's, it happens when we're born. What, what our, see, the, the character is passed down through the generations, part of this character, part of that character. My brothers and sisters are a mixture of my parents, but we're, we're, we have the same DNA and the same genes because we come from the same parents. All right? Uh, so First of all, we're born with these things, and we're going to explain that a little bit later, too. So the character of our parents is passed down to us. Maybe you have more of one parent than the other, but there's a mixture, but that character is passed down to us. We're born with that, so we're off to 
uh, and whatever problems they had can be passed down to us. This is the curse that goes down to the fourth and the fifth or the tenth generation. Uh, and, and if they had bad habits, then, then we can develop those bad habits if we're not raised differently. Um, I raised my children better than uh, my dad raised me, and my children are raising their children better than I raised them. And so we, we've got this thing turned around in our family and it's going in a positive direction, but it doesn't happen overnight. So the first thing is hereditary. And you'll find that in your own family, uh, you're from the same parents, but you're all a little bit different. You're not exactly the same. Then it's the influences or the social environment or family uh, that we grew up with, grew up in, and, and how that affected our hearts, that, that atmosphere. If you take two child, two children, two babies, and they're born and they don't have parents, their parents died or something, you take a child and you put them in one home that is a good Christian home, living in God's principles, has a lot of love and discipline, they're going to turn out a certain way 20 years later because of that influence. You take that same child and put them in an abusive home, alcoholic parents, parents that don't love, don't care, or don't know how to show their love, that child is going to rebel and turn out totally different 20 years later. See, so it's our social environment. Our world is changing so fast that they have a new name for every 10 years for the next generation because of, of the technology, what they can be influenced by, all of these things. I know I, I knew an older pastor, he's passed away, he's a friend of mine, and he said after the world, Second World War, the average pastorate that he stayed in one church was 23 years. Why? Because people were used to working together, because the war caused that. The crisis caused them to do that, and they, they developed a certain character, and they took that character over into their church life. But then, uh, as he was talking to me, 50, 40, 50 years later, he says the average pastor now is three years because that's all the abuse a pastor can take because he doesn't know how to handle the abuse when it's coming. And they don't have the authority in a lot of churches to deal with the abuse. We'll, we'll explain all of those things also. But see, life changes, the world changes, people change, and it's the influence of our society. Also, as you're growing up, uh, if you were poor, maybe you were mistreated, maybe you were picked on at school. All of that has affected your heart, your, your self-image of yourself. All of those things we're going to explain that come into your heart. Also, the third thing that causes us to be the way we are is our reactions to the situations in life. Let me explain this uh, very simply. If you uh, do something that to hurt me or it hurts me emotionally, and if I don't forgive you, then Unforgiveness comes into my heart. Bitterness comes into my heart. It, tur it turns into resentment and bitterness. And the Bible says that bitterness is the seedbed for every demonic work. This is what the devil works with, is that anger, that evil that we've allowed in there. We're going to talk about uh, how to forgive from the heart, to release all those things. But these things come into our heart because of our reaction to the circumstance and the situation. We didn't know Jesus. We didn't know how to forgive from the heart. We only did lip service or, or so forth. And then all these things come up. Uh, and then we react a certain way because our heart doesn't reason. It just reacts. See, if we have rejection in our life and somebody offends us, then we're hurt and we retaliate or we become passive. We'll, we'll talk about those things. But see, that becomes a habit in our life or, or bad-mouthing people, or, or gossip just to uh, get even with that person. That becomes a bad habit, and that bad habit then becomes a part of our character. And we just keep that and grow with that, and it gets worse and worse over the years. And so this is what has caused us to be who we are. Uh, so we are who we are because of the past. Part of it is inherited. But part of it is we didn't understand the spiritual principles of life and how to incorporate them into our lives, or we weren't taught these spiritual principles. We didn't know to do that. Uh, and so we didn't do it, and we got worse and worse. And this is why we are who we are. Now, we're going to talk about the three main root problems that we have in our hearts, and that all the other problems 
flow out of that. And so we're going to start with, uh, and, and this will help us to understand our own character plus the character of others. Whatever is in our heart in abundance, a person is full of rejection. In abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can just hear it in what they say and how they act. You can see it in their body language. If a person is full of rebellion, you could, it comes out of their heart in one form or another. Criticism of others, anger towards others, uh, trying to get even, all of that, that comes out of rebellion. So from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if we're full of these things and we haven't dealt with them properly, even as Christians, because we didn't understand how, then we're going to deal with all of that. So we're going to talk, first of all, about rejection. And rejection is a root problem. We were created to um, experience the fullness of God's love in our hearts. And so we can be born with rejection. So already we're off to a bad start because uh, love... Rejection is not receiving the love that we need, and it causes all these negative things to happen in our life. God is love. If we were full of the love of God, then we wouldn't have any of these negative emotions. So we need that love from a parent. Uh, and sometimes, I know my parents loved me, but they didn't know how to show it. So there's that problem. They love you, but maybe they, they had their own problems. They had their own rejection they had to grow up with. They didn't know how to deal with that, so it's passed down from generation to generation. So with rejection comes loneliness. Oh, nobody cares about me. I'm so no good. See, the, you're lonely because you, you don't have any, you have rejection in your heart, massive rejection that has grown, and when somebody rejects you, maybe you get angry and you have a negative response, and then they reject you even more. See, it's a whole negative cycle that keeps going in a circle downhill and it gets worse and worse. So with rejection, loneliness automatically comes. Timidity, we're, we're, we're shy because we're not outgoing because we have a whole negative self-image and all these negative things in our heart. And so we are shy. Uh, we're timid, we're shy. Self-pity. Uh, because we don't feel whole, because we've been rejected, we, we feel sorry for ourselves. Oh, woe is me. Nobody cares. Nobody loves me. Nobody listens to me. See, all self-pity comes from rejection. Fantasy comes from rejection because our hearts are created in such a way that they react and our heart is trying to survive. I think this is why we, we all have heroes, sports heroes, or any kind of heroes. Even in the body of Christ, we have teaching heroes that, that get us excited. And, and, oh man, they're the best minister. We listen only to them. They had the same problem in the church at Corinth when Paul wrote a letter to them. He says, who is Paul or who is Apollos? Only servants of God. Like, don't put one man above another. Because it's just revealing that... Well, I follow this one, or I follow that one. No, we're all God's servants. Follow all of them. You follow one man, you, you have to use all the giftings of the body of Christ, not just one man. And so we fantasize. As a child, you may have fantasized. A young boy will fantasize. Maybe he's interested in sports, and he fantasizes about being the greatest baseball player ever. Uh, you, you hear this on TV, if you watch golf, they'll say, well, yeah, this is, uh, I'm used to this because when I was three years old, I used to think that this putt is to win the Masters. <laughs> you know, they're fantasizing because everybody wants to be better than what they are because of the rejection that's in their hearts. And so we can fantasize about things. Uh, even as Christians, um, we have rejection in your heart and you're called into the ministry and you don't know how to deal with that rejection. You'll fantasize about having the biggest ministry, the greatest ministry, the biggest church, all of those things. But they're not, and, and that might happen if you learn to deal with your rejection or otherwise you're going to be operating out of your heart and God wants to deal with your heart. Um, lust. See, if I have rejection in my heart, it's like I, I have a, a big hole that needs to be filled supernaturally by the love of God. Uh, I had a wonderful wife, a good farm, good business. We were making good money, wonderful children. 
but I still had a lot of rejection in my heart. See, man cannot fix that. It, when I came to God, then I learned how to deal with my rejection. But until then, nobody can fix it. Only God can fix it. And it's when, when I first accepted Jesus into my life, I had this wonderful experience. I knew I was saved, and, and my countenance changed. Everybody said I changed. My countenance changed. My attitude changed. And it was like, why didn't somebody tell me about this? This is so wonderful. See, because the love of God was shed abroad in my heart. I used to be in barroom brawls sometimes, but now when I went to church, I would cry every Sunday. It was embarrassing to my wife because they'd sing Amazing Grace and I'd start crying. Well, it was, it was something that I'd been lacking for years and now I was there and I was just so happy. There were tears of joy in the sense that, wow, God really loves me. God has accepted me. Wow, this is so wonderful. It caused me to bring joy. It's like you've been separated from somebody uh, for a number of years and all of a sudden you come back together. You're so happy you can't help but cry. It's that type of a situation. And so there's a hole in your heart. Uh, and if we, we don't fill that hole, we will try to fill that hole with making a lot of money or uh, keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak, or um, it, it can turn into lust for money, sexual lust, because what does the flesh want most? We try to fill that hole the world's way, so rejection can result in sexual lust, because if you don't understand love properly, you think that making love is an accepting thing, and then you want to make love with as many people as you can. So it can create a very strong lust within your heart, sexual lust. But lusts of all kinds can come into your heart because of this rejection. Um, insecurity. Well, we're not secure in our own character because of all this rejection, all this negativity in our heart. See, your feelings come from your heart. Your emotions are in your heart. Uh, negative self-image. Oh, I'm so no good. Nobody likes me. See, rejection just feels that way and talks that way. And it always comes out that way. Self-rejection. We don't even like ourselves because of all the negative things we see or feel within our heart. We can look in the mirror and we don't really like ourselves. Self-hatred, fear of rejection. Uh, if we've suffered a lot of rejection, then we have fear of rejection. We don't want to be rejected anymore. So what we do is build spiritual walls around our heart and we don't let anybody in because if I don't get to know anybody really close, they can't hurt me. They're just a stranger. See, and so, but when we build these walls around our heart, we're not letting Jesus in either because this is me and nobody's going to hurt me and I don't trust anybody. See, all of this comes with rejection. So there's a fear of rejection, which then turns into a, a fear of performance or standing in front of people or, uh, or doing something new and doing something different. Oh, I, don't, I can't do this. I'm not capable of doing this. And that rejection may have come in because maybe your dad or your mom said, oh, you can't do this, you're so stupid. You know, all of these negative things have been put into your heart. Your heart, whatever you hear, and you accept that as truth, then that is stored up in your heart. And as a child, you tend to believe that. Uh, children that parents have gone through a divorce, they blame themselves. And if that thinking isn't straight, straightened out and they keep that thinking, then they're always blaming themselves, it's their fault. And they believe that in their heart because that thought comes because they don't understand. Why did mommy leave? Why did daddy leave? See, this is why God hates divorce because it affects the child more so than it does the parents. Um, then we come to jealousy. Well, because I don't feel whole, I'm in the ministry. If, I, my, if my um self-worth is not in Jesus Christ, then I'm going to be jealous of the church down the road where God is moving and good things are happening. Do you see what I'm saying? And so I found this a lot in ministry that people are jealous of what other ministries are, bad mouth other ministries are, because they're not whole and they want to happen in their church what God's doing in another church. And so it's, it's this jealousy. And I've seen it even in Guatemala, where the people are poor and um, a pastor is jealous of another pastor. He's only got six people in this church, but the other one has 10, so he's jealous of him. 
What's there to be jealous about? <laughs> you know, six people or ten people. But see, it's a thing in the heart. And here's the problem. If, if our identity is not in Jesus Christ, we'll talk about that later, because we're a new creation. We are in Christ Jesus. The uh, Bible talks about who we are in Christ Jesus. That has to become our identity. It starts with righteousness by faith. But if our identity is not in Jesus Christ, then our identity will be in our ministry, or it will be in our job. It will be in our social club. Everybody's looking for identity someplace. Maybe you were a child and you weren't the best baseball player and had to sit on the bench all the time. Oh, I'm not good enough. They tell me, see, everything is a negative if we take it that way. And when we're negative, a negative self-image, then we don't push forward to get better because of all these negative feelings. Because we live out of our heart and all that negativity is in there, we don't even desire because we just don't feel like we can do it because of all the negative things that have been spoken of us and the things that have happened to us. And then we're envious of others. It's along with jealousy. We, we, we wish we had what they had. We want what they have. But even if we got what they had, we'd still have the same problem because we haven't learned how to deal with our rejection. See, we're, we're, we're looking to different things to fill that void that we have in our heart. Uh, people can become murderers this way and angry and, and, and all of these things, but they got a hole in their heart that they can't fill. They become alcoholics, drug addicts, because they're trying to fill that hole and it's never filled and they get addicted and it just gets worse and worse. Then eventually it's a downward cycle because these things, rejection, brings more rejection because of the way we react, and it's a negative cycle, and, and then eventually it gets down to depression, where we're so depressed we can't even function right. Of course, now they call this mental illness. You go to a psychiatrist, and you have depression, they give you happy pills to make you happy, but they're not dealing with the heart issue. Thank God for them, I'm not putting them down, we need them, we need them to get stable so that we can even grow a little bit. All right, so doctors are very important, psychiatrists are very important, they're all very important, but the answer is supposed to be in the church. How do we deal with rejection? We have this new life in our born-again spirit. How do we work that into our life to get rid of our rejection is the key answer that we have to look for. And then when depression gets bad enough, it turns into suicide. And it's a big thing among young people. Suicide rate is high. We have no more reason to live. Why don't we just kill ourselves? Let's get it over with. Uh, you know, there is no vision for the future. There's no hope. There's no nothing because of all this rejection, and they don't know how to deal with it, and it's just a negative cycle. When it gets to that point, depression and suicide, even anywhere is in there, it can get very strong, and that's when demonic spirits get involved. And when you have a lot of rejection, it allows that sin principle in your flesh to interact with that rejection to make it even stronger because you're going to be controlled by one nature or the other. This is why we have to have a revelation of righteousness by faith and what God has done for us. And that revelation of righteousness by faith has to be stronger than the rejection in our heart. I've heard people say, the Bible says but, that God loves me, but how can I experience that love? We're going to talk about that and deal with those things. And, and the church, there is no perfect church because there aren't perfect people. But we have to teach these things, love, acceptance, and forgiveness. But people off the street uh, or prostitutes or alcoholics, they come to a church and the church doesn't want them there. They don't know what to do with them because they don't know how to help them change. They don't know how to deal with them. And, and it's like a, a culture shock. Oh, how do I treat this person? How do I talk to this person? I, I, I really don't want anything to do with this person. And the person, even in the church of Jesus Christ, doesn't feel accepted. It's very, very important that we understand these things. And uh, there's one or two things happen when we have suffered rejection. We either become passive and let people walk on us, or... The opposite happens, and depending on the depth of your character, if you're a strong person like me, you rebel because your heart is looking for survival. And, and rebellion says, no, I am somebody. I'll show you. Don't mess with me. You know, and then we get into the whole area of rebellion and what that brings about. We're going to 
study that in our next session, but it's important to understand this and understand your own heart. But we are, see, we're sort of taking you apart now and showing you what's there, but we're going to put you back together and we're going to fix you <laughs> with the help of the Lord. We're not going to leave you apart, but you have to keep following these series and the teachings. We're going to take you through the whole process of inner healing, how to deal with rejection, how to deal with all these things, tell you how it got into your life. And as we speak, when I, when I teach these things, everybody knows that there might be one specific incident that caused major rejection in your life that you can tie into. And when we can deal with that area, then you can get set free and now you can start growing. So it's very, very important that we understand that. Um, I'm just going to take, teach you, uh, tell you a quick story. My dad, I went to visit him. I've been pastoring for 10 years and he was sitting at the kitchen table and he was crying. And I said, my mom had already died. And I said, dad, why are you crying? And he started to tell me a story about when he was 15 years old in Europe and he was out plowing with the horse all day. We we're going back a lot of years. And as a 15 year old boy, he, he plowed from sun up to sundown. Then he went in, put the horse up into the stall, looked after the horse, went into the house and his dad was sitting there. And at that age, every child needs affirmation. Son, you've done a good job. I'm proud of you. And when he walked into the house, his father said to him, how's the horse? And it just devastated him. And 70 years later, he's uh, talking, he sat there in the kitchen crying. For 70 years, he had that rejection. And I understood why he couldn't show us the love that he needed to show us as a father, because he was trying to deal with his own issues, plus feed us, plus work hard on the farm, and, and all of those things. And so he didn't, he went to church all the time, but he didn't know how to change his heart. He didn't know his heart. He didn't understand why he was feeling that way. So I was born with that rejection. And I was amazed to hear him say this. And I said, well, Dad, you treated us the same way. I wasn't trying to put him down or anything. I just couldn't understand. If you know how you feel, why did you treat us that way? But he didn't know how to treat us any different because he was so consumed with that. And he said, I know I did. He realized he did, but he didn't know how to change. But in Jesus Christ, we can change that, and we'll show you how. So that 70 years, he lived with that rejection, and it affected his relationship with his kids. It affected his relationship with my mother. It affected his relationship with God. It affected the way he talked, the way he acted. It affected everything. For 70 years, he was controlled by that deep rejection. So we're just getting into this. Uh, I hope you keep coming back so that you can learn more, not just for yourself, but also be able to help others. So we'll continue this next week. Thank you.